Hey, what is going on, everybody? Welcome to Upkick MMA episode 400. I am Brendan. All right. Uh, this is UFC Fight Night, Cannoneer versus Imabov. We have a lot to talk about as far as bad stoppages, including the one in the main event. We'll talk about all that stuff. We're going to break down all the fights on the main card here. Talk them. Talk through them all round by round. If you like this kind of stuff, subscribe to the channel. That way the next video is coming out. I'd appreciate it. Let's get right into the fight. Interesting fight. I have not looked at the scorecards yet. We will look at the scorecards together, and I will give my reaction to those. Uh, let's go. Let's go. Let's go. All right. Cannoneer landing the lead hook in the right hand, going with that low kick really well. It was working for him early on. I'm surprised he didn't use it as much later. Like It, st it seemed like he started to... Uh, he started to hold back on it a bit because Imovov was countering it, but he was still finding the mark. We'll talk about it. Cannoneer throws him to the ground, landing a couple shots. Imovov warned about his fingers being out in Cannoneer's face multiple times. Imovov having issues with Cannoneer's pace uh, and pressure. So if you look at the striking numbers here, clearly Cannoneer's round 21 to 14. Uh, the damage definitely went in his favor. Um, I had it 10 to 9 for Cannoneer. Second round, Cannoneer landing that low kick, Imovov countering with the jab, Imovov landing a nice one too, but then Cannoneer with a one of his own, and then uh, a shove from Cannoneer, it gets into the clinch in the cage, Cannoneer with those jabs, countering the low kick, Imovov getting into the clinch, uh, Imovov was swinging really big trying to land something to get this round back, uh, Imovov landed a good shot, and then Cannoneer fires back, and then a really nice headbutt from Imovov. Uh, it's said that he outstruck him here 28-17, to 17. Uh, I thought it was pretty close. I think, oh, those body shots, the five body shots. Yeah, I guess he he outstruck him here. When I was watching this live, I thought it was really close and that I gave it to Cannoneer for the cage control. So, <clears throat> like I said, this it could easily be 19-19. Uh, I had it 20-18 to 18 in favor of Cannoneer. But easily could be 19-19. It was a really close round. It really came down to like where you gave the damage. I thought Cannoneer did enough damage early in the round to negate the stuff that Imovov was throwing later. And then if you do go even, you go with cage control. And that was Cannoneer. So third round, Imovov gets the back body lock, drags him down. Uh, he gets out of it and then back to the clinch. But then Cannoneer just keep, he, he keeps landing those heavy low kicks and Imovov comes over the top with the counter. And then C Cannoneer lands a hard like three piece of his own. So it's one of those things where he was throwing the leg kick. It was working. Imovov finds a counter to it, but then Cannoneer counters his counter. So it's like, yes, you're getting countered, but the things that you're doing are still working, and I thought it was really effective. This round was also pretty close as far as striking numbers go, 21 to 18 in favor of Imovov, but I thought, again, I thought the damage went to Cannoneer. Uh, you know, those hard low kicks and the stuff up top, and then, again, the control time. If you don't go with the damage to Cannoneer, looking at the total strikes, they're a lot closer, 33 to 29. If you don't give the fight to or this round the damage to either guy, then you go with control time, and Cannoneer had more control time. Uh, initially, Imovov was winning this round, in my opinion, but then I thought Cannoneer closed the gap. Which brings us to the last round here. Uh, spinning elbow landing for Cannoneer, but then loses control, back control. They get back to the middle after that. A hard right hand from Imovov wobbles him pretty good. And then Herzog steps in the fight. Horrible stoppage. Um, also, by the way, the arena was empty. I don't know if it emptied out after Imovov won or if it was empty the entire night. But it was empty. Nobody gives a shit. Anyway. <clears throat> we can talk about this now. There was multiple bad stoppages on the night for different reasons. This one was an incredibly early stoppage. I don't think a stoppage was warranted at all, let alone an early stoppage. He was intelligently defending himself. The moments, the worst moments had already passed as far as the damage goes. He was throwing back. And he was looking at his opponent. Did he run away after he got hit? Absolutely. Yeah. Was he getting his ass kicked in this round? Would, would taking a ton of damage? Absolutely he was. Yep. Is there a chance that Imovov finishes this fight if the ref, uh, if Jason Herzog lets it go? Again, absolutely. So give him that chance because that's not what we got. What we got was a horrible stoppage. Right? Go back and watch Cannoneer versus Strickland. Go back and watch Cannoneer versus Robert Whitaker. 
uh, he's been hit hard. He's been hurt real bad and still finishes fights. He comes back and still wins some of those fights. And it, it wasn't that he was out of it. Uh, let's look at the scorecards here because I want to I wanna see how the score, the judges had it. Look at that. Janitro Camillo had uh, two rounds to Imovov, one round to Cannoneer. Saldi Amato and Dare clearly had the first and last round, or the first and third round to uh, Cannoneer. Uh, they gave Imovov uh, the second round, which is understandable. Like I said, when I was scoring it, I think I, uh, I think I might have been uh, overvaluing some of the stuff that Cannoneer was throwing and undervaluing some of the stuff that Imovov was. But that being said. <clears throat> this is a live fight going into that fourth round or go fifth round. If Imovov, Imovov continues on this track, doesn't get a 10-8 in this round, wins the round, we're talking about a 2-2. Two to two. We're talking about going into the fifth round and needing the fifth round to win. That's all it is. It's an even fight. And we didn't get that. We didn't get any of that. We didn't get the opportunity. Kananir didn't get the opportunity. It fucking sucks. It really sucks. They're both ranked fighters. Right, well, uh, Jared Cannonier is number four. I think Imovov was seven. Yeah, he'll move up after this weekend. But that's what I'm saying. Like these guys, they're ranked fighters. This, this is title. This is title contention shit. You can't, you can't be doing this. I, I don't think you should be stopping fights early, regardless. But this stoppage w was not warranted at all. I think Imovov uh, made some adjustments and he started to look really good and started to come on late. I think standing down, biting on his mouthpiece and throwing down hard really helped him out. But um, Kananir was still in the fight. It, he was not out of it. Like he got caught. Like he had, he was, he was doing fine in this round as far as far as it was going on, and then he got caught. It's not like it's not like this was a one way beatdown for three rounds and then it was mercifully stopped in the fourth. No. He got caught, his equilibrium went, and his legs were wobbly. He wasn't, I don't even think he was really, uh, like, getting punch, like, uh, not punchy. Um, I don't, he never really, he didn't take a punch on the chin, right, and lose consciousness. It, he was conscious the whole time. He was with it. He just lost his balance. And there's a difference between the two, right? If you get hit behind the ear and your equilibrium goes off, you're still conscious and with it. It's just your legs don't work. Like you, you, you look like a baby gazelle out there because you, your body literally cannot balance itself. Okay, it's like when you watch a dog try to stand up in a car, especially for the first time, right? It's because their equilibrium is totally trashed and they have no idea what's going on. They're still conscious. They're still with it. So I, I think. I, I doubt that they're going to go back and investigate this. There's, uh, you know, it's unlikely they'll talk about this past this weekend. Um, this will probably be the end of this. I'll remember it. Hopefully you guys remember it. Uh, Jason Herzog screwed this one up. Normally he's a pretty good ref. Uh, this is just a bad, bad night for him. He screwed up. Okay. Dustin Jacoby taken on Dominic Reyes. Um, I, oh man, this was a, I hate to see either one of these guys lose just for two reasons. Uh, one, Dustin Jacoby's, uh, currently on his ascent or trying to ascend to the ranks, um, trying to be a, a new contender in the light heavyweight division. So I'm always, ha I'm always happy for that kind of stuff. And then you got Dominic Reyes, who's been on a skid and hasn't had a win since 2019. And since he beat Chris Weidman back in 2019. And he lost to John Jones in a controversial decision. Jan Blachowicz, Yuri Prohoshka, and Ryan Spann. Four fight losing streak. So this was really big for him. This was, you know, like he could have been cut. Uh, Reyes finding the mark with that jab. Jacoby looking for the low kicks. Uh, frantic moving for Jacoby. Reyes looking for that hand control and that counter. Jacoby finding the mark with a bunch of shots, but Reyes lands a right hand and follows up with a bunch of volume, gets a TKO. Uh, it looks like that's exactly what Reyes was looking for. He was looking for a counter. He was looking for that counter right hand, um, counter maybe even with the left. He, he was really trying to counter Jacoby's pressure and catch him coming in, and that's what he ended up doing. So, uh, you know, there's all these what ifs, but, um, you know, it's light heavyweight. You know, these guys throw hard. Uh, one punch can change the fight. Same thing with middle, like a lot of these upper weight classes, you know, you, you just got no room for error. 
All right, Raul Rosas Jr. versus uh, Ricky Tercios. <clears throat> we'll see what happens to this kid. He hasn't been beaten up too bad, uh, but it is what it is. Uh, we'll, we'll we'll talk about it uh, when he when he starts doing stuff later in his career. Tercios getting the kicks to the <clears throat> the legs and the body. Rosas wants to take down, gets it at four thirty. Um, the crowd is saying "fuck you, Ricky," which is a little weird. I don't know where that's coming from. All that control time and no damage for Rosas. Uh, Tercios gets on top and then gets it back and going for that rear naked choke. Rosas had control, but no damage, no sub attempts. This is Tercios's round. So if you look at the control time here, Rosas had three minutes and 40 seconds of control time. How many ground strikes did he have? Ground significant strikes he had? Zero. Uh, how many submission attempts did he have in this round? Zero. Uh, how, how much? How many? What, what total strikes? 21 to Ricky's 50. Um, there's just no way that Rosas Jr. wins this round. Second round, well, I do want to check those judges' scorecards. Yeah, Mike Bell, you're full of shit, man. Janitra Camillo and Saul Diamato, I can't believe I'm agreeing with you. This is the thing. Mike Bell values damage sometimes, but then it, like, I, I, I usually think that he's a consistent. I just don't know what he was seeing there. What did he see in that first round that made him think that Rosas Jr. won that round? How was he closer to finishing the fight? How was he laying out more damage than Tercios did? All he did was have more control time. That was literally all he did. It's a moot point. Um, Mike Bell screwed that up, but uh, in the second round, Rosas is really aggressive, going for flying knees. He gets to the back and gets the rear naked choke finish. Uh, good for him. I, I, like I said, I, th there's two ways these uh, early careers go. Well, three, you know, you have the burnout guy gets pushed by the UFC, steps up in competition too fast, gets burnt out, ends up uh, uh, flaming out the UFC. Second option, maybe there's four options. Second option is you get burnt out. No, no, it still call, it comes under the same thing. So it's still three options. Second option is you get a gradual step up in competition. You develop over time and then you become a contender and possibly a champion um, just a little bit earlier than most people do. Or maybe in the same timeline, you just develop in the UFC instead. And then the other option is uh, incredible, incredible rise to fame. Get your early title shot. You become a champion and you know then your career is pretty much set. So which one is he going to be? Um, the, the first one is most likely all the time. I think that I've said this before, uh, Rosas has some things about him that I think will allow him to advance a little bit better. His grappling, the way he goes for that stuff, instead of, um, just slanging and banging all the time, um, that will prevent some of the, the, the damage to build up early. I mean, uh, it, it looked really good for, oh crap. He just won last weekend. What is his name? Oh my goodness. It wasn't last weekend. It was two weekends ago. Ah, forget it. It doesn't matter. Is it even more than two weekends ago? This is stupid. Why am I doing this? Chase Hooper. God dang it. That was a waste of time. Sorry, guys. But it's the same kind of thing. Chase Hooper comes in super young. He's a grappler. Gets hit a lot, though. And uh, doesn't have, like, incredible wrestling. Now he's starting to turn it around. Uh, I mean, he's th he's got gotten some wins. It's not that he hasn't done done anything. I think that uh, he, he's probably taken more damage than he would have if he developed on the local scene, the regional scene, maybe coming up through LFA or some of the, uh, the other organizations. So... Uh, as far as Rosas, you know, does he does he take more damage than he needs to at this point in his career? Uh, based off the who he's fought so far, no. I think it's been okay. So um, he might be all right. Uh, Bruno Fajeda versus uh, Dustin Stoltzfus. It's just turned into <clears throat> a firefight. I hate to land in the right hand and then swing him back. They swing back back and forth. Both guys landing. Hard right hand from Stoltzfus, then a takedown. Stoltzfus falls off the back and goes for some leg locks. Can't get it. Runs him down. Both guys looking labored. 
Fajeda landing a hard spinning back fist. Stolzfus is hurt bad. And then both guys land. Stolzfus is like, shit. he's like, he's he's on Queer Street real bad. And then another one eventually uh, gets gets through and uh, the, the ref stops it. Who Who is this? And this is also Jason Herzog. He comes in and stops it. Um, I don't know if this is the the worst worst stoppage. I thought that it was fine. Stoltzfus obviously was getting um knocked off his feet multiple times. Oh, that's the other thing about Cannonier. Never got knocked down a single time. Uh, yeah, Stoltzfus was damaged pretty bad in this one. Uh, it's I'm always down for a fun fight. It's just not uh not a lot to break down as far as technique or what happened. The guys just throwing hard shit at each other. Julian Marquez versus Zach Reese. Not a lot to break down as far as statistics go. Uh, Reese with the body kick and then a right uppercut. Marquez goes down and then the follow up <clears throat> and the TKO. It's over. Uh, it might have been early as far as I'm concerned. Um, it's weird how the stoppage is. Um, looking back through all these stoppages as you watch them, um, how inconsistent they were throughout the whole night. I understand that they're different referees, but that's the point is you want the consistency in the judging or sorry, in the refing, regardless of who's in there. You don't want the referee to dictate the type of referee or the, the referee it's himself to dictate how the fight's going to go differently than any other referee. You need to know that when you go in there, everything's going to be the same. Obviously, you know, there's subjectivity and humans are different, blah, 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 blah. I get all that. That's not what I'm saying. I'm just saying that <clears throat> throughout a night, if you notice that his fight gets stopped early by a guy, and you're like, okay, like we can make a correction to that slightly, but it's not even it's not even about that. It's literally just like they're, it, whatever they're looking for just seems completely different from ref to ref, maybe from night to night, even fight to fight. Um, Julian Marquez looked like he was responding, looked like he was sitting up, um, didn't even let him follow up with it. I, I didn't even let, really let him follow up with many, many pun uh, any punches and called it. So. Uh, who is the referee for this one? Dan Rigliotta. There was a fight earlier on the car, on the prelims, where, uh, yeah, the main one. We'll talk about that in the next video. Ludovic Klein versus Thiago Moises. Did this to him multiple times and didn't stop the fight. Followed up with a bunch of unanswered shots. Yeah, they hit the guard, but and that didn't do it. Like, I, it doesn't make any sense to me. I don't get it. Miguel Baeza versus Puna Soriano. Isn't it Puna Haley Soriano? Yeah, it's Puna Haley. Why did why did they not put that on the broadcast? All right. Uh, Baeza was going for the clinch and landed a couple knees. Like it's turned around and taken down. Baeza going for that uh, heel hook, taking a ton of shots to the chin. He did have the uh, the heel hook, but it was the inside heel hook, which allows the knee to turn out and gives you uh, a little bit of uh, leeway. Like they're both bad, and you can catch the heel, like you can rip the knee apart from the inside or outside heel hook, absolutely. But the way it was going. Uh, Soriano was able to just turn his knee just slightly to avoid some of the pressure. And then he started laying out some ground and pound on him. Uh, Baeza keeps, like, he just kept going for that leg lock. It took, it took a ton of shots. He was trying for different things. He went for a, a knee bar and ended up just taking more shots to the face. Like, yeah, these are deep submission attempts, but um, just so much damage. Soriano ends around getting another takedown, landing a ton of right hands. For, the striking numbers 42 to 5 in favor of Soriano. Not even close. Second round, 10-9 uh, because of the submission attempts, but not even close. Second round, Soriano gets him down right away and back back to the right hands. Baeza rolls under, gets his guard back, still trying to attack from his back, but it ain't. it's not working, man. Not even close. Baeza is just sitting down, uh, sitting on his hip or on all fours, and Soriano is just like laying out tons of damage. 49-1. to one. As far as striking numbers go, that's a 10-8 round, so I have 20 to 17. Last round, almost the same thing. It just it's just ridiculous. Um, obviously I had 30 to 25 
the two 10 8 rounds. One of the judges had it 30 to 27. Chris Kinman. Who the fuck are you? No, I'm serious. Like, who is this guy? Who's Chris Kinman? What, do, do you want to see them dead to give them a 10 8? What, what are you looking for? Tell Diamato and Derek clearly, um, who've, you know, both screwed up their fair share of cards. Both, I think, uh, I think got this one right. Give, giving it the same way I did. Not That's not why I think they got it right. I had 30-25, right? Um, the, the, it's that it makes sense. Even if they gave it 30-26, right? One of those rounds a 10-8 and the other one's a 10-9. Um, maybe. But those rounds were 10-8 rounds. It was not even close. So put this in perspective. Let's say Baeza won the first two rounds for whatever reason. For whatever reason. Let's just say in some scenario, he wins the first two rounds um, by just being in control. You know, in the grappling situation, maybe going for heel hooks, not taking a ton of damage. Let's say Baeza wins the first two rounds. And then it comes down to that last round and you outstrike, uh, then Punahaley outstrikes him 53 to one, lays out a ton of damage, be, is on top the entire time. And then Chris Kidman decides to give him a 10-9 round for that. Well, Soriano would be losing that fight. On the other scorecards, he would it would be a draw, and that's the right call. That's why this is important. It's not because oh well, you know he got the right score, he got the right winner. So why does it matter? It matters because this guy clearly, like at least in this example, shows that he's not fucking paying attention or doesn't know how to score a fight. So how can you trust him going forward? Chris Kinman, good God, man, thirty twenty seven, two ten nine rounds. For one-way traffic, literally one strike landed. The guy's on defense the entire time taking damage, and you think that's a 10-9 round. There's something wrong with you, dude. You screwed that up. Maybe it's a one-time thing, but you had two rounds to get it right because <laughs> they were almost identical to each other. So maybe that's why he gave it a 10-9. He's like, oh, shit, well, I gave it a 10-9 for round two. Can't give it a 10-8 in round three. Oh, well. At least the guy, like, I hope that they don't think like, oh, well, at least I got the right guy winning. Who cares? I hope that's not a thought that goes to their head. That's a really, really bad etiquette. Okay, that's it. Uh, thank you guys for, uh, for stopping by. I know we've got the UFC hangover thing. You know, you get a big event, lots of build up for all that crap. And then the next weekend, nobody really watches. But if you did watch this, I super appreciate it. Subscribe to the channel. That way you know the video is coming out. And if you like the like this video, hit the like button. Um, I'll, I'll be putting out the, uh, the video for the prelims in a little bit. So love y'all have an amazing week.